yeah, welcome to HSL lesson one. Um, I want to introduce you guys to uh, Jack Eck, uh, Wickrum Wickrun, who works at the Urban Foundation, and he's going to be sitting in. He's a core developer, so he's going to be helping us out in case we run into any like intensely technical questions or anything. So uh, big thanks to him for being here. Um, a few preliminaries. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, so a few preliminaries. Um, I have put everybody on a Luma emailing list. So you guys should should have been seeing emails like uh, one hour before Hoon School Live, five minutes before Hoon School Live. Um, if you haven't, then please check your spam. But um, any further course communications are going to be through there. So please check that. Um, office hours are now set. So um, uh, they're going to be Mondays at 5 Eastern time. Uh, Fridays at 1 Eastern time and Saturdays at 1 15 Eastern time. So uh, like a little break between this, between class and office hours on Saturdays is going to be when that's at. And um, they're in the Urbit Hacker House. So the link to that is going to be in the syllabus. Um, all right, I think that's everything. So let's get into the lesson. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let me open the chat. Uh, let me know in the chat if you can or can't see my screen that I'm sharing right now. All right, awesome. All right. So, uh, so far, learning about Urbit, you may have heard a lot of talk about like planets and moons and stars and so on. Um, so what are these things exactly? Um, an Urbit ship is a running instance of Urbit with a unique network identity like sample Palnet or Camelot Modernize. As a computer, an Urbit ship has state, which ultimately reduces to data stored as zeros and ones, as you might recall from the last lesson. And it has operations, which are formal rules for transforming those zeros and ones into other zeros and ones, as you also might recall. So your planet that hopefully you got by now is on the network, and it's what we call a live ship. So live network identities are finite. Um, there's only so many of them, about this many planets, this many stars, and this many galaxies. Um, then they have some value. So uh, you want to be a little safe with them. You don't want to uh, needlessly crash your planet, for example. Um, so most people, when they do development, they don't develop on the live network, but they use something called a fake ship. So you can run Urbit instances on your local machine that are not connected to the wider network. Um, and I'll walk you through how to do that right now. So um, first, you'll want to go to this link. I'm going to post it in the chat. And after you go to that link, um, if you go down here to section two, you'll want to select your system architecture and then just copy paste this command and then just run it in uh, your command line wherever you want to create your urban folder. Um, so if you want to follow along with the lesson, um, I would suggest trying that right now and just getting the Urbit binary if you don't have it, because it'll let you just run things while I'm running them as well. Um, all right. So, oh yeah, as a note, um, Urbit runs on Unix-based machines. So if you have Windows, um, we would suggest either you use Windows subsystem for Linux to simulate Linux on your Windows machine or to dual boot. Um, all right, so I'm gonna assume that you guys we're able to do that. And next, you want to go to your Urbit directory and to boot an instance of a fake ship for the first time, you want to do the following command, urbit f zod. Um, when you press enter on that, it's going to run for a couple minutes and then it's going to boot up what we call a fake zod. Um, I already pre-booted mine, so we don't have to wait several minutes for me. 
Um, so to start my ship that's already been booted, I'll just do urbit uh, Zod like this. And that's how you start a fake instance of an urbit ship running on your local machine. Um, so now that we've booted our ship, we're in this environment right here, and we're introduced to something called the dojo. The dojo is simply Urbit's command line environment where you can use command to access and manipulate your computer. So here's an example of a command. We can do plus ls send, that's what this is called. And here we have a list of all of the uh, files and folders in, in the root of your Urbit. Uh, yes, you can follow along in the Tuan terminal. That should be totally fine. Um, so I'll I'll paste this command in the chat as well. So so what's this saying? This is saying uh, we went into the root of our orbit and we saw all these files and folders. Um, but what if? Let me try something else. So here's the folder for my Zod. Right, I just created this on my computer. Um, and uh, we have something here called base. So, so what is this? Um, Urbit organizes your collections of files and code and so on into things called desks. Um, and desks, they live on, on Urbit on what we call, as an analogy, Mars. So Earth and Mars are not necessarily synced by default. So for example, I can use this command here to unmount the base desk. And if we look here, uh, base has totally disappeared. So I can continue to do stuff here. It just won't sync up with what's going on on Earth on my Unix system. Um, however, if I do mount base, then uh, it'll pop right back up. Um, so that's kind of how you get information from your orbit onto your onto your Earth system. But what if you wanted to make some change, like add a file or edit a file, and then push that change uh, to your orbit? How would you do that? So uh, I'll show you right now. So a generator is a saved snippet of code you can run from the dojo. And the syntax to run a generator is like this, lus hello dad to world. Oh, uh, yes, I should increase the text size. Thank you. Yeah, good call. Um, so this is the syntax to run a generator. Uh, what happens if we press enter here? It's giving me an error. It says, uh, basically this long error message says it didn't find that. All right, so what do we do now? Um, let's open up a text editor on Earth. Like so, this is VS Code. And then uh, we'll copy paste. Um, copy paste this code into this file and we'll save it. Um, where will we save it? So we'll go to our Urbit folder, we'll go to our Zod, we'll go to the base desk, and we'll go to a folder called gen and we'll save this as hello world.boom and save it. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we're back here on Mars and we're going to run commit send base to specify the base desk. And what happened? It said we added a file called hello world home. And now what happens if we run the same command as before? Now we get something popping up. So uh, we're going to use this process a lot. This is what you're going to be doing when you develop and you uh, push some changes. Um, when you make some code and you want to save it and try running it. Uh, yeah, so I will, yeah, so uh, the file, um, I'll include all this in the notes. Um, the files go in the gen folder in the base desk and mount is, uh, you're taking a, a desk that exists on Mars, but doesn't look like it exists on Earth. And then you're making it appear on Earth. Um, but yeah, there'll be notes, so don't worry. Um, all right. 
So if you want to exit your ship at any time, you just do bar exit. And then you can just go back into your ship. Yeah, ships are just machines. Mm -hmm. And um, as you learn to program in Hoon, uh, you'll inevitably do something that like breaks your fake sod. Um, and to guard against that, you can uh, make a backup of your fake sod. So it's pretty simple. If you know uh, Unix command line stuff, um, you'll be familiar with this. So you do cp r zod, and we'll copy it to a folder called zod backup. And that's it. Um, now we've saved the state of our fake zod into this folder. And if zod ever breaks, all we do is just rename this folder to zod and delete the original one, and you can boot it from there. All right. So the dojo is not just for like looking at your files and poking around with them. Um, but you can also run Hoon code directly in your dojo. Uh, one very important thing to remember is that the dojo will only let you input uh, Hoon code that is syntactically correct. If you try to type something that it's invalid, it won't even let you press the next key. It'll just make a sound. Um, for example, in Hoon, uh, numbers greater than 999 are, represent, are represented uh, with dots instead of uh, commas, mar marking every three decimal places. So I can type 999, it's fine. But if I try to type 1000, it won't even let me type that third zero. So I have to do this, and now it's happening. Um, if I try to do this, it won't let me press enter, because that's not a well formed number either. So that's kind of a nice feature because it tells you exactly where uh, you're going on with your syntax. Um, all right, so let's go high level again. What exactly is your urbit? So we discussed last week that information is data plus a way to interpret that data. So on the most basic level, it's ones and zeros. Um, and if we go up to the highest level of interpretation, uh, it's your computer is like an app or something that you're doing or a, a network identity and so on, right? Um, but what if we just go up one level of interpretation from the ones and zeros? Um, we can say your orbit is actually a big binary tree of positive integers. Uh, this binary tree structure is at the heart of the orbit system. So uh, it's really important to understand it well and how to work with it. Um, so in particular, everything in Urbit is a noun. And the way that a noun is defined is a noun is either an atom, which is a single positive integer like this, or it's a cell of two nouns. So a noun can be an atom, Noun can be a cell of two atoms. Noun can be a cell of a cell and of two atoms and an atom, and so on and so forth. Um, you can build increasingly complex structures with these nested cells. Um, but I was just talking about binary trees, right? And these are cells. So what's the connection between them? Well, uh, they're actually uh, completely isomorphic structures, the same structure, just like a different way of looking at it. So uh, this is how you would like convert between these two representations. So a number is just a number, right? If you have a cell of two things, it's just a binary tree with like a left and a right, right? If you have a cell of a, a number and a pair of things, well, you just expand this into two things and so on and so forth. Then you can expand this nine into a zero and one, you can expand this five into an eight and nine and so on. You can get increasingly complex binary trees by just replacing the single number with a, with a pair. Um, all right. So if we're storing data in binary trees, we need a way to access the data. Um, the way that we do so is uh, by numbering the, the nodes in the binary tree as follows. So in particular, one is going to describe the whole tree. Uh, two describes the subtree under the node two. Uh, three describes the subtree under the node three. Eight describes the node eight, and so on and so forth. Um, for example, let's consider the following noun. 
So uh, cell of 8 and 9, cell of 10 and 11, together in a cell. Cell of 12 and 13, cell of 14 and 15, together in a cell. So this is represented like so. Um, and to maybe think about, make thinking about it easier, you can also think about it this way. So here's one. It's the whole thing. The whole thing, you get the whole thing by grabbing this. Uh, if you want to grab 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, you, grab, you grab this. Um, if you want to grab 12, 13, 14, 15, you grab this. And if you just want to grab a single number, you just grab these and so on. I hope that makes sense. Are atoms in a noun unique? No, you can have a pair of like one and one, for example. It's fine. Um, so we can actually represent this in the dojo. So uh, what I'm going to do now is called pinning a face. So I'm declaring this name for this data structure called tree. I'm setting that equal to be this, this structure right here. All right. So let's get the thing at the address five. So what's the address five? One, two, three, four, five. It should be 10, 11, right? And the syntax I'm going to use is like this, plus five dot tree. And we get 10, 11. Great. And what if we want to get the thing at address 10, which is the number 10? Same thing. Plus 10 dot tree. And we get that 10. So uh, we may not always want to represent data structures as pairs of things, right? Uh, it's a super common data structure to have tuples, like a, a, a tuple containing three things or four things or a million. So how would we express that in, in this uh, structure? The way we do so is as follows. So if we want to express a cell of one, two, three, um, we, do it, we do it as a cell of one and then the cell two, three. And that expands to this binary tree, like so. Um, if you want to do one, two, three, four, that's it's a similar concept. It it's nested, these nested things collapse, and it corresponds to this binary tree right here. Uh, we can test this in the dojo. So if you want to do this. You can see that indeed this gets formatted as one, two, three. It removes that bracket. Um, and you can just remember that. These are equivalent representations. They're just different ways to print the same underlying data structure. All right, so before when we um, when we were looking at this tree, we were saying go to address one or go to address two or go to address five, right? In the real world, that's a bit like saying go to 200 Main Street in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, however, you can also uh, navigate with uh, uh, directions like uh, go right for one block, go left for two blocks, and go right for one block, right? Um, in a uh, tree data structure in Urbit, this is what's called Lark notation. So Lark notation uses the four characters uh, minus, plus, and left bracket, right bracket. Um, and uh, how you use it is you have to use these interchangeably. So first you do a minus for left or a plus for right. Then you do a left bracket or a right bracket. Then you do a minus or a plus again. So that's how you kind of point your way through a tree. Um, and we can do this in the dojo as well. Uh, is the dot notation the same as indexing? Sorry, I'm not sure what that means, but you can ask me, feel free to DM me after class. Um, all right, so we pin this tree again, and then we can do, uh, this is called hep, hep.tree, and then we get this subtree, and then we can do lust.tree, and we can get this subtree, and uh, so on and so forth. So that's a pretty straightforward concept, right? Um, the only tricky thing is you have to remember to alternate these symbols. Um, all right. So back to our analogy about navigating in the real world. Um, sometimes addresses are so notable, you don't need specific directions, right? I could say, go to the Eiffel Tower or go to the White House. And that clearly conveys uh, the location that you should be going to. In Urbit, um, the uh, and the analogous situation is assigning what we call faces to parts of our tree. 
Um, and we'll go back to the same example. Um, but this time we've attached these little uh, variable names called faces to parts of our tree. All right, so A is this number, B is this number, C is the cell, and D is this number inside C. All right, so now that we've labeled them, we can do A dot tree, get that number, D dot tree, get that number, C dot tree, get the cell, and then we can even do D dot C dot tree, and then get the number inside the cell. Um, and what's interesting about this is you can even use duplicated faces. Um, so for example, consider this data structure. Uh, in a lot of programming languages, that might throw you an error, but in Hoon, it's totally fine. And that's because uh, when you search for a, uh, so let's call this uh, A. So when you search for a face, it actually performs a depth first search and returns the first thing that it hits. So if I do B.A here, it's actually going to search this and hit the hit this one and return it first. But you can actually access all of these with this notation. So if I do uh, this ket.b.a, it's going to return the next result. And I can do I can do it even more. I can do I can get that forward. All right. So that's the high level of navigating binary trees within Urbit. Are there any questions on this section? Um, on the tree, on the on the right side, and on the image, if you would go one level deeper, what would the next? Uh... Yeah, here you go back to using the left bracket or the right bracket, just alternates. Okay. Another bracket. To alternate. Minus and uh, yeah, okay, I see, I see. Thank you. Yeah. All right. If there's no more questions, I'm gonna keep okay. moving. On. I I, oh, yeah. I have a I have a question. Sorry if this is kind of low level, but like if you have uh, duplicate atoms in the tree, are they stored in memory? Like, are they duplicated in memory? Do you know? Uh, I I'm not really sure. Um, duplicated. It depends. In it depends on how large they are so like w w if a pointer is cheaper to store then it's deduplicated if it's cheaper to store just the number directly then it's not deduplicated cool thank you yeah that's okay a thanks um uh, so i got a question how can i print the root of the tree so if you have like uh if you have it under a face like you can just do b oh or usually uh you can do um, the root. You can, yeah, right. So, like, I have this tree called tree, and I just type tree and I printed it out. So, that's how you print the root of the tree, I guess. Um, uh, I'll answer this. Uh, you can DM me about this because there's a lot of content in this le lesson, so I have to move quickly. Sorry. Um, all right, so we have just given a high level overview of the way that data is stored in your orbit. Um, however, uh, we said nothing about how the computer actually computes. So um, NOC is the formal system that underlies orbit. And a NOC computation is a transformation from one binary tree of positive integers to another using clearly specified rules. So in the last lecture, we covered a simple arithmetical formal system. Uh, here's a specification again, if you'll recall. Um, and it's pretty straightforward, right? You have, if you have add A, B, and A, B are numbers, then you reduce it to that number, and so on and so forth. And here's an example of derivation in that system, right? So you have this tree, you collapse the mole to three into a six, you collapse the add six, five into an 11, right? Um, but not only could we reduce uh, trees where we know all the values, we introduced the idea of a system that is that can't be computed yet because it's waiting for some input. Uh, once it receives the input, it can substitute this value in, and then it can carry out the series of reduction rules to get the result of the computation. 
Um, so we can call this the data in the computation, right? And we can even rename this. So I'll I'll call this 10, the subject, and I'll call this this computation the formula. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, we're approaching something that describes how NOC how knock works. Um, in particular, any NOC code is a cell containing two things. The subject, which is a binary tree, which is the data input, and the formula, which is another binary tree, which describes the computation. All right. So here is an example of a simple NOC computation. So uh, this is the binary tree we remember from before, right? So this is uh, this, this binary tree, and now we've put it as a subject in our NOT code. And we have this formula, which is just a zero two. And what does this mean? So the NOT rule of zero says when there's a zero and there's a number after it, that just grab that, that address from the subject. So in this case, we're going to go to address two in, in this code, and then we're gonna return the subtree starting at address two. So that's that's what's going on right here. Um, and if we wanted to grab address eight, it's the same thing. So this is pretty straightforward uh, reduction, right? Um, but we can actually chain together uh, a lot of different um, knock uh, expressions. So for example, here we have a formula, which isn't just one thing, but it seems to be like two things chained together, right? So what's going on? Uh, knock rule four just says, given a, an atom, increment it. Just go from one to two or 55 to 56, right? And here in, in these brackets, this looks familiar. This is zero two. This is the same thing that we saw before. Just grab the thing at the two address. So we take this, we put it together, and we interpret this knock four. We say, oh, we know what knock four means in increment the result of the rest of the computation. So we pull this out, and this is what we have left, right? And then we use the knock rule zero to compute this. This says, grab the thing at address two, which means grab this 50. And then we just increment the 50 to get 51. How do you know what knock four means? Yeah, so these are all like predefined. Uh, they're, they're axiomatically predefined. Like uh, they are the rules of the system that are written down. Uh, you can find them in the, in the docs, for example. Um, uh, I mean, you can if you want to, but um, I, most people just know them as knock zero and knock four and so on. So yeah. Um, the, I think like 12. Um, uh, you, uh, I'll, I'll have a link in the notes and you, you guys can, can look at that. Um, so yeah, why is address 250? So um, we can go back here. So we have, we have this, right? So this is the numbering. One returns the whole tree and two returns a subtree in, in, this, in this, right? So in, in this case, we had a cell of uh, 50 and eight, nine. So in this case, uh, here would be 50. The, the whole tree would be 50, eight, nine. So address two is 50. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jack, for chiming in. Um, all right. So here's another knock instruction. So this is very similar to what we just did, but we have a three instead of a four, right? So what does knock three do? Knock three says, return one if it's a cell and zero if it's an atom. So we put these together, we have this, we pull out the three to this pseudocode, and then we have this left. So just compute zero two on 589. And this is just what we did, right? This says pull out address two of, of this subject, return 50, and 50 is an atom, 50 is not a cell, so return zero by, by this reduction. Um, and finally, there's one more rule. Um, knock rule five says we have two formulas here. Um, compute both of these on the subject and see if they're equal. So uh, we have this is this is our knock expression. Uh, we we take out this five and we reduce this to fifty eight nine zero two and fifty eight nine zero six. And then we use knock rule zero to reduce this 06 
to grab this eight, which is in address six. And then we use this zero two to grab this 50, which is in address two. 50 is not equal to eight, so we get a one. So um, the point of this is not to like comprehensively go through NOC. Um, however, we want to understand the flavor of it. NOC is a simple mechanical formal system based on binary trees, and it underlies all of Urbit, everything you do in Urbit. Um, Hoon compiles to NOC and is very close to it structurally. So by getting a feel for how NOC computation is like, we can get a feel for why Urbit and Hoon are the way they are. All right. So let's start with the Hoon. Um, so our first topic is going to be runes. So what is a room? You might have heard this term before. Uh, it's a combination of two symbolic characters like kol hep or what lus or tis faz. Um, these are how Hoon specifies operations. Um, there, there are kind of like keywords in other languages. Uh, Oh, there's a good question in the chat. A bit theoretical, but are there any proofs, mathematical justifications showing that 12 knock rules are the minimum needed to make the language Turing complete? Actually, the first five knock rules that we just covered are enough to make the language Turing complete. And there is a proof, but I'm not going to go over it in the class. Um, so good question, though. All right, so back to runes. So uh, the simplest possible rune you can learn is a rune to make a cell, right? So we've been working with cells and cells of cells. Want to learn the room for making a cell. This is the room. So it's col hep one, two. That makes a cell for us of one and two. Um, and we don't have to give uh, atoms as input. Like we can give another cell as an input to this room, and it'll still make the cell for us. And there's something important to note here. Um, Hoon differentiates between a single space and two or more spaces. If I try to run this code with one space, it doesn't even let me type that one. I have to make two spaces and then type the one, and then two spaces and then type the two. Um, but I can even run this like a bunch of spaces. And that's totally fine. That's equivalent to having two spaces. Or I can even press the enter key in between, and that's equivalent to spaces. All right. So in case you get tripped up on that, uh, this is important to remember. So you may have heard me just calling these runes like some weird names, right? Uh, Hoon has a system where every symbol that we use is mapped to a single syllable so that every rune has a two syllable name. So this rune that we just use is called Kol Hep because it's a Kol and a Hep. You don't have to learn or memorize all these immediately, but you will learn them over time as you read and write Hoon code. And I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, this has a table with all the pronunciations in it. So let's go back to this Kohl hep room again. So we can even do something like this. So what's going on here? So this Kohl hep takes two arguments, right? Kohl hep, child one, child two. It seems that this child two is not a number or a cell, but it's actually a another col hep room with two arguments of its own. So what's what's going on? Um, so we could have col hep with both its children as nouns, um, with the one and two as we did, or we can even just have these be complete Hoon expressions that reduce to a noun. So that's why this is okay. Because this, when when you parse this to col hep two three, this reduces to the cell of two three, and that's totally syntactically fine. Um, and remembering that everything's based on binary trees, here's how you would parse this Hoon expression that we just typed as a binary tree. So it would be like this, and to parse it, you'd have to first parse this col hep two three into the cell, and then you parse this all together. All right, so are, are there any questions on that? Um, we can even do like this. Uh, we'll have, so, so this statement, even though it looks a little weird, it looks like you're feeding a Kohlhepa one, two, three, 
actually what's going on is this inner Kohlhepp grabs this one and two, this parses, and then that cell is fed as the first argument to this outer Kohlhepp. So it's a cell of one, two, and then a cell of that and three. All right, was that clear everyone? Yes. Great, cool. Um, all right, so that's a very simple group, right? Uh, let's get into some slightly more advanced room. Um, we can even do some stuff that's very reminiscent of the knock that we just learned. So this uh, rune called Tis Lus takes two children. The first child is a noun, which you will make uh, the head of the subject. And the second child is some operation to perform. So uh, in particular, uh, if we go, if we go here, um, we can do Tislas, a cell of five and seven, and then we can go to uh, the Lus two address, and that gives us five and seven back. So what's going on here? Well, we've put this Tislas rune has put five seven into this data address, and then we said the operation we want to do is go to that data address and return what's there. We can even do like this. Now this is saying, this is saying, put this five seven at the head of the subject, grab it with this lust two, and then grab the lust three address of whatever is here. So five seven is here, which means five is here and seven is here. In particular, if we renumber this, this is one, two, three. So that means three is right here, and this is gonna give us seven because seven is there. Um, here's another rune. So this rune called dot less uh, takes one child. Uh, that child has to be an expression that reduces to an atom. It's so like a single number and it just increments, it, right? So dot less one is two. Dot less 100 is 101, right? Um, we can combine it with uh, the last rune we just learned. So for example, let's consider this operation. So we're doing uh, tis lus, this cell of two cells. So we're pinning to the head of the subject a cell of the cell 24 and the cell 1618. And then we're saying, do the increment operation on the seven address of this thing that we just pinned. So what is the seven address of this, right? So. Um, Where's my tree? So we have two, four, 16, 18. So two is here, four is here, 16 is here, 18 is here. So that means 18 is gonna be the number here. And this says, just grab that 18 and increment. So if you run this, then we get 19, right? And these operations pretty much correspond to the knock zero and knock four uh, rules that we just learned. So this is some pretty straightforward bare bones stuff, right? Where we're looking at trees and addressing them and manipulating their values. But like most of the programming that you do is a lot higher level than that, right? Um, you know, you're working with text, you're working with lists, whatever. Um, most languages have a bunch of standard library functions you can call uh, that aren't necessarily part of the primitives, but they're like built-in library functions that you can do all those things. And Hoon, Hoon is the same. Uh, Hoon has uh, what are called the gates. Um, these are predefined functions that you can call to handle all these things. So calling a gate in Hoon looks like this. We have the, this room, uh, senhep, add, colhep, one, two. Um, so what's going on here? Run this and we get a three. Uh, somewhere in Urbit's big binary tree, there's something to find called add. We, we call senhep add. It goes to the closest instance of add that's defined in the tree. If you remember uh, when we had this, this A tree, right? And then we did B dot A, it's similar to that. It's looking for the closest B that's defined. So this is looking for the closest add that's defined. 
um, if, if you defined another ad in your local code, uh, it would grab that instead. But then you could grab the original ad by doing ket add. So it's a similar concept. Um, this rune that we're using, this uh, send hep, it takes two arguments. So the first argument is the gate that you're calling, in this case, add. And the second argument is an argument for the gate. So um, in particular, like if we try this, just give it one input. It's not going to compute because it's 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 waiting for that input. Um, and if we do this, let me make this. It's going to give me an error. Um, that's because add the gate add specifies that uh, it takes a cell of two integers. Uh, can we only call gates with send hep? No, there are a lot more uh, uh, runes to call gates, but this is the simplest one, so we're going to learn it first. Um, so there's several other standard arithmetic gates that pretty much do what you expect. So the send hep sub will have five, one, four, right? Uh, send have mole col have four three twelve, and send have div col have a two four. I think that as a function. Yes, these are functions. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we don't have to type out this col have. Like you can just collapse this into cell notation. That's totally fine. Sorry, I just want to chime in. They aren't exactly functions, but I, like we. We shouldn't go into in which way they aren't, but it's a very like th that analogy will get you very very far. So just remember that for now. Okay, thank thank you for the correction. Um, all right. So so far we've uh, been working with the assumption that is all computation in Urbit essentially performed on binary keys. Yes, so it's very important. So that's why this lesson is very important to understand how to work with. All right, so um. So far, we've been working with the assumption that atoms, like our basic atomic values, are just positive integers, like one, two, three, four, five, right? So for NOC, this is true. However, like for practical computing purposes, we need more data types, right? We need negative numbers, we need floating point numbers, we need text, and so on and so forth. So Putin's type system is a metadata layer over NOC. It says, given an integer, we can interpret it in this way as a text string or in this way as a number or something else, right? So these are called auras. Um, and to interpret an atom as a certain aura, we use this syntax. We use tick at tick and then the atom 100. And at uh, or what we call pat is the most basic uh, aura. This just does nothing to it. This just says render it as an atom. So that's why we get 100 back. Um, in Hoon, we have several ways to represent numbers. So for example, we have floating point. So here we have this big integer. And if we cast it to a floating point, uh, pat rs, we get uh, 3.1415. Uh, this dot in front is to signify it's, it's a floating point. Um, we can also represent things in binary. So we can interpret the number one, uh, 100 in binary, get this. And we also have hexadecimal. So um, of course, we can also handle text strings. So what happens if we cast this huge integer to a text string? We get hello. And what happens if we cast uh, this huge integer to a pat p? So pat p is, as you might know, a ship identifier. You get sample palnet. And we don't have to start with an integer. We can go between different auras. So for example, we can cast Zod, the galaxy, to a pat UD, and we get a zero. And we can cast this pat P to a text string, and we can get hello. Um, so there's many, many more types that um, we're not going to cover here. But um, yeah. So are there any questions on that? Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry if this is off topic, but I asked the question about if everything is, if all the computations are 
performed on binary trees essentially uh i'm wondering like how would you go about like doing something like a hash table a uh, hash table that's a great question and that's basically we'll get into using things like hash tables later in the course and their implementation details are um a, a little more obscure um so yeah maybe jack can actually if if jack knows it, anything about that maybe you can try yeah, if it's covered yeah. later that's fine okay. so, so we don't cover Jake. exactly how it's mapped to a binary tree but we do use them yeah so short answer is just that like it's still a binary tree underneath uh but you you can use that to build basically anything like lists or maps or whatever uh, you just need the right algorithms to operate on them so you can actually access what you want mm -hmm. but you you wouldn't be able to access it in like oh one though if you're using a binary tree right uh, that is correct uh well mm, depends if you already know statically the address in, in the tree that you're going to uh, then you do know that uh, because yeah, then you can just advance technical discussion for um maybe you can come yeah to sorry so you can dm yeah. one of us yeah. if you want but yeah, no, feel free to good. dm me if you want or or just jack yeah so these, these are these are great questions um but we have full class here so um we have another question why did das dopzel big reg famtol get casted to hello that's a great question so i here i showed that this integer 478564130032 when we cast this to a pat t, we got hello, right? So this is the integer underneath the text string hello. So what can we do with this? We can say, okay, what are you as a pat p? What is this number as a pat p? And we get this pat p, right? And then so if we cast this pat p back to a pat t, then we get hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any more questions on that? All right. So that's a high level overview of auras. Um, basically, there this is not Hoon's entire type system, but an important component. All right. So when we're coding, we'd often like to assign a name to a value so that we can reference it later, right? Um, to do so, we usually use this rune called tisfas. Um, it takes three children. The first child is either just a name, or you can do name equals type um, to specify a type for this value. Second child is a value, but it can be a Hoon expression that, once computed, reduces to a value. That's totally fine. And finally, uh, third child is the rest of the Hoon code. Um, and to express this in like a functional pseudocode, this is the equivalent of let name equals value in some function, depending on this name. So here's an example of how we might use this. So we have tisfaz n28. And then it's still waiting for this third child. That's why we have this inverted carrot here. Um, send have add we'll have n10 and we get 38. And to help you better parse this, here's the tree expansion of this code. So first child is n, the name. Second child is the value. Third child is this Hoon expression. What is this Hoon expression? Hoon expression starts with a send hep, uh, a gate call. The, the child of that is add. And the next child of that is colhep making a cell of n and 10. And when you call this n right here, it knows that since you store this in the subject, it knows to grab this 28 for this n, it evaluates this to 38, um, and then it returns. And uh, as I mentioned, you can also like specify the type of it. So here we're saying n has to be a pat ud, an unsigned uh, decimal number. Um, you may recall this syntax from before, like I did equals tree something something. Um, this is a dojo specific syntax. 
So uh, this pins some values to your local session. It's not usable in general whom code, but it is usable in the dojo and it's useful for that. So in the dojo, you can do this N15. And then you can do uh, compare, add and file. All right. So um, that pretty much brings me to the end of the content that I wanted to cover today. Um, I guess we're a little um, or above schedule. So yeah, I can do uh, I can do questions now and anything you guys want to ask. Um, we're going to have office hours, um, in about 20 minutes or so. So yeah, we can continue answering stuff there. Double spaces. Yeah. So this is like a Hoon convention. Um, when you have a room, a, a single space is parsed differently than a double space, but a double space is parsed the same as three spaces or four spaces or, uh, an enter, right? So when when you have uh, spaces between rooms, it has to be double space um, or or more. Here, when when you're doing this dojo specific syntax, like equals n equals m two or three, that's a, actually a single space. Um, there's a lot of things that you like kind of just have to remember, but um, yeah, mostly in in general, it's double space. This is kind of the uh, like formal like a space in in hoop yeah cool yeah are there any more questions yeah i had one about um can you discover the uh, indexes and what is at, at them by some means other than just trying it out in the dojo to see what's at a certain index? Could you print the tree out in some way? Like of your whole orbit, you mean? Uh, no, not, not, not of the orbit, but of um, some value. Or uh, like if I wanted to encode a table uh, and I was curious what the indexes were or the, the addresses were of specific rows. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely possible in general. Um, maybe Jack can answer on how you might particularly implement that. Um, I'm like, you probably wouldn't do that in practice. Uh, it's definitely possible, but the language is designed in such a way that you mostly don't need it. Uh, like we, we can look at an implementation like if you in, in the public channels or if you DM, DM me. Okay. Yeah, I apologize, guys, because I uh, I rushed through this lesson because I thought there was so much content, but it turns out we're uh, we we went a little too fast. But yeah, so I I think um, I will end the lecture here, um, but we can I'll, I'll end the recording, and um, well, thank you. Um, if you have questions, definitely feel free to stay in here and keep asking me or uh, come to off stars. Yes, there will be an assignment. Um, I will release it uh, within 24 hours because um, I'm a little tired. <laughs> um, but yeah, that'll, that'll be out soon. So thank, thank you guys for being here. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Let's end the recording.